2019 summer series, what we've been doing is um, every night we have a visiting speaker from um, different congregations come and um, deliver a lesson on a character um, from the Old Testament. But particularly this year, we're looking at Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, Job, characters from um, those books. Our speaker tonight is Brother Wesley Walker, and Wesley, everybody knows here at the congregation, uh, married to Amanda, children Presley, Audrey, and Emmett are all here. We're excited to, to have them here. I'm sure Grandma and Grandpa are excited to see them here, uh, too, as is all of us. Um, Wesley preaches for the Woodson Chapel Church of Christ in Nashville, um, Tennessee. He's a graduate of Freed Hartman University, uh, worked out here in California for a few years too as well in Corcoran. And I know yesterday he was actually preaching up at Woodward Park and now is here. So he's part of two different summer series. And we're thankful that um, Ken Perry and his family from Woodward Park are here tonight. See, they came on Thursday here. And if they have a service on Wednesday there, I'm just saying we can make something happen here where we go back and forth and visit each other um, this summer. So, um, But we're glad that Wesley was able to um, speak um, tonight on the topic of Job's wife, you know, as it relates to the overall theme of the book of Job. So I'm going to turn it over to Wesley, and the podium's his. Angelic beings who walk before they're having conversations with 
God and you're getting a, an insight into a world we don't normally think about that you have this spiritual associating with, from what we can tell, Satan. And that, that sort of is the first sort of uneasiness. You, you get this great story of a great man with great wealth, and then you start off with this sort of negotiation between God and Satan over the life of Job. Not some minor thing, but God tells Job, Satan tells God, he only serves you because you've given him everything. And so the text says this, God allows Satan to do terrible things to Job. Praise, offer sacrifice for his family. I mean, this guy's going to worship Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night, and he's having family devotionals and he's saying prayers to God and he's giving extra to support different works and he's evangelizing his friends and he's praying for his kids. And he, if they forget to sacrifice, he makes sure that a sacrifice for him. He is the, the ideal person, he's a righteous man. And yet the story is about the destruction of his life. It would be one thing if the story started off with there's this righteous man named Job and Satan did bad things to him. You can handle a story like that, right? Where we stop and we think, yes, Satan is known to do bad things. I can see that. But this story is not there's a righteous man named Job and Satan did bad things for him. In the middle of this is there's a God, our God, who says, yes, you can do it. He limits it and then takes that limit away. But the story is God tells Satan, we'll test his faith then. Think about that for a moment. God could have kept the hedge of protection around Job. See how that makes me uneasy? You know, when we pray, we pray for God to, to take care of things and to remove things and to heal things and for God to do stuff. And we pray because we believe God has the ability to do those things, right? We, we think He can heal things and change things. But what happens when it appears from our perspective that God has removed the hedge? And when you pray and things don't change. So you have the story of Job where this man who's righteous in every way and Form. has his wealth taken away, his barns taken away, and his family taken away. And stop for a moment. He's done everything right. And God removed the hedge. And it's all taken away from him. And then his health's taken away. And Job sits in an ash pit for the, basically the rest of the book trying to figure things out. If you've ever suffered before or witnessed somebody suffered or had bad things happen, that hits you maybe in a raw situation because here you are thinking, I'm not perfect, but I'm righteous. I'm not without blame, but, but God's forgiven me and I, I'm trying to do what God wants me to do, but yet these things happen. And from our perspective, we know why. We might not like why, but we know that God has allowed Satan to test Job and to see if his faith is genuine or not. We know that's what's taking place here. Job does not. He doesn't get an introduction to his story where he finds that it's a big test. And I wonder if Job might be madder if he did. The story works through with Job's friends coming up and trying to explain to Job why this happened to him. Oh, surely, Job, you've done something unrighteous. You deserve this. In the back of my mind, I go, how bad did Job have to be, or at least his friends had to be, to deserve something like this? What, what kind of friends look at you and say, Job, you truly have sinned in some way. How bad did Job have to be? He lost everything, his family. They're all dead. He doesn't have his health, and his friends are saying, let's figure out what sin you committed. One of the fellow preachers at Woodson Chapel's wife passed away of ALS uh, last year. Her and Emma were diagnosed the same week, uh, or about the same time, with CF and then her with ALS. And we prayed for her and prayed for her and prayed for her. And we prayed for Emma as a church, and we watched her decline in health, and then she died. We watched Emma struggle and having cystic fibrosis and knowing the stuff that goes along with that. You've got that there. And then you read Job, and you... Know that God could have put a hedge around her, or in my case, my son, 
or in the case of most of you, there's somebody in your life that you said, God could have protected. That's what Job starts with. The story goes on, and you have the sort of rundown where each friend is trying to explain to Job why you have sinned. And each one of them says, Job, just admit your sin, and God will relent. You just, just say what you've done, and, and I won't steal the person who's going to do Job's big point. But Job's storyline is basically this. I'm a man of integrity, and I'm going to keep my integrity, and I'm going to continue to be righteous because I don't deserve this. And throughout the entire story, Job is a man of integrity and a man of righteousness as everything around him crumbles. But all of his friends are saying, Job, you've done something bad. Even his wife says, Job, just say goodbye to God. Our Hebrew word there is often translated cursed, but the word can be translated like bless God. Now in the South, we'll say bless Him, and we mean something bad when we say bless Him. But in this case, it's almost similar to that. I don't know if Job's wife is from like Southern Earth or wherever they're from there, or other where it's that place there. But she has the, the Southern mindset of just bless God and move on, which basically says, Job, are you sure you want to stay committed to a God like this? I thought we want to think about Job's wife. We normally look at her as being this sort of heartless individual who, who is, who's, who's, who's terrible to her husband. But don't forget, she's lost all of her wealth. She's lost all of her family. She has a husband suffering. She's seeing all of this. She might have her health and everything else has been taken from her. And her mind said, she's saying, Job, is it worth it to follow God? Job, are you sure it might not be better just to say, God, I've given up. Take me out of this. Maybe not curse God in the sense that we have, or you throw your fist up in some way, but just say, God, you've won. I don't want to serve a God like this. So he has this whole situation of bad things happening to him over and over again. Asking God why, and God doesn't tell him. And at the end, Job gets what appears to be a happily ever after, right? A wife and ten kids and more money? Let me ask you this for a moment. God forbid this happen. Let's say tonight, if you had children, God took them all. But promise to give you ten more five years from now. Would you trade it? Would it seem whole to you in that moment? Would it seem like everything's worked out because, hey, I've got ten kids now? Would you not care about the ones that had roofs falling upon them? Do you not still have that in the back of your mind? I mean, even the restoration of Job, to some degree, seems uh, a bit like it. Yes, he gets things good again, but let's not forget what happened to the guy. There's still sons and daughters laying in graves that he lost. You don't see the uneasiness of the book? There's no happy ending. It, it, it's written that way. It's, it's written to be a, a sort of a, what we might call an ancient epic, this idea of this great story like you might see in, in terms of, of Iliad, the Odyssey, those sort of ideas of, of walking through the condition of man, and you have this happy ending at the end, but it's not as happy as you think it is when you think through the whole story. You think, well, hang on a second. He, he had wealth. He had family. He had people. He gets it back tenfold, but, but no parent says, well, yeah, take my son and give me ten more, and we'll, we'll call it even not how things work. And so Job is one of those books that, let's see if I can get this to move, makes me uneasy, and I think it's on purpose. What's the point of the book of Job? You know, some say Job is about answering the question of why do men suffer, but read the book. It never answers that question. Not one time does we get any explanation on why men suffer. All we get is one of those almost like you do as a kid when your, your child is asking you questions and you, you got this, you know, why is this and why is this and why is this? You just say, I told you so or because it's what your mom and I want to do. Well, you just tell them basically you don't need to know an answer and maybe you can't handle this answer. That's what God does to Job. Shows up in a whirlwind with all this power. And tells Job, where were you when all these magnificent things happened? And in chapters 38 through 42, we have the creatures being mentioned. We have the stuff that takes place. And we have the creation of the world. And he says, Job, where were you? Did we consult on this? Were you a part of my divine counsel? Did you give me insights? No. So I'm not going to give you any. 
Now, for a book that's supposed to answer why do we suffer, it does a terrible job, right? Because the end of it is we still don't know. In fact, Job has no clue. We have more than Job does because we've got a section that says Satan is testing him, but Job doesn't know why we suffer. And the book doesn't necessarily explain away righteous suffering versus unrighteous suffering because we're still not given a clear reason why. Yes, Job is righteous, but does that mean every righteous person should expect a Job-like moment? How many people raise their hand and say, I'll become unrighteous? If, if, if being righteous means I'm going to face a Job-like scenario, then I don't want to be righteous. So it's not like every righteous person has a Job moment where they lose everything and get tenfold other stuff at the end. That's not how things work either. The book's not answering those questions. The book is purposely dealing with the reality of life as we know it, that life exhibits a randomness to suffering, and sometimes we can't explain that, and we just have to live it anyways, and sometimes, to make it even more uneasy, God's behind that suffering even though it's indirect. We sometimes want to and I think it's fair to say this, we want to give God a, an out, so to speak, where we say, well, our sin causes suffering, which is true. Sin caused the suffering you see in this world. But, but Job doesn't give us that option because we know God could tell Satan enough and this all stops. So I'm assuming God could do the same for any of us. If God could put a hedge around Job and bless him, couldn't Job put the hedge around me and do the same for me? So it makes me uneasy. I read Job and don't think, yes, I've got answers to take place and things looking great. I read Job and I come back with some serious questions. But I think that's the reason for Job. We want simplistic answers to difficult situations. You know, the big thing on the internet now is listicles. We have like, you know, 10 ways to make a million dollars or five ways to, you know, smell better or whatever it might be. And they want to have these sort of quick things here. There's no listicle for Job. There's no like four ways to guarantee you won't suffer or two, two ways you can find out immediately why you're going through hard times or how to build a hedge that not even God can tear down. There's none of that we have here. It's supposed to have us end here and go, Man, we live in a world of unpredictability. So all we can do is live righteous with not having answers. Isn't that kind of hard to do though? That God wants you to live righteously with unanswered questions and tells you you can't handle those questions. You've got to keep living. So Job's big premise of the entire book, as we kind of walk through the book, and we'll get to his wife in just a moment, his big premise of the book is this, that the righteous suffer. Don't, don't leave Job without that idea that God doesn't work in a quid pro quo manner where if you're righteous, everything's great, and if you're unrighteous, everything's terrible. Now, there's several Bible verses that give that general truth. In the book of Proverbs, Righteous are blessed, and the unrighteous suffer. We're told that, so don't deny that to some degree, but that's all things being equal in general in our world. If you do righteous things, you have righteous things happen to you. If you practice unrighteous things, you'll have bad things happen to you, but there's always more exceptions than we want to really handle. So the righteous suffer. For a while after Emmett was born and the things took place, I remember staying up late at night and wondering, is God punishing because I didn't pray enough leading up to the birth of Emmett? Or is God punishing me because I didn't pray enough during that time period where we were wondering if he had CF? And as, you know, you kind of go back to your life and say, was I, not, was I not righteous enough? Did I not pray enough? Did I not do enough? And you begin to want to figure things out. And all of us have a tendency to say, at least give me an explanation. Tell me why it happened so I can handle that. So, so let me know I'm unrighteous and that's why you did this, God. After every national tragedy, they try to figure out what was the reason this person or that group did a thing. And oftentimes, we never get an answer. And it frustrates us because we want answers. All Job says is this, the righteous suffer. And on my worst days, I would say, and God just says, deal with it. Because it's life. Sometimes things happen. And the righteous suffer. I'm supposed to say, so your voice are you like the clicker? I just, all right. Cliff has unbelievable talent over there. Knowing why is an answer we never receive. You know, every now and then we'll have a natural disaster and some televangelist on TV and say, God destroyed this city and, you know, fill in the blank for what particular sinners are saying God's out to get. We don't really know why we suffer. Suffering's bad enough. 
But suffering with unanswered questions is even worse. You know, I'm diabetic, so if I know if I eat too much sugar uh, over a long period of time, I'm going to have complications later in my life, and I can kind of make those tie together. So I know that there's a, there's a, there's a tie there. You kind of know those things work together. But oftentimes, there's no tie. Wouldn't it be great for God to say, here's why this happened? That is the question Job wants answered. He tells his friends, stop talking. I'll put it more bluntly, he tells his friends to shut up on a couple of occasions and said, I'm waiting for one person to answer, and that's God. And Job believes he deserves an answer. And he's not the only person in the Bible to stop for a moment and say, I deserve an answer here, God. Read the Psalms for a moment and see the righteous people of God say, God, you made a promise to me, but you didn't keep your promise. You, you told me you would do this, but you didn't do it, so I want an answer. And yes, sometimes the answer is the just will live by faith, but we still want an answer. We want God to, to tell us, why did you do this to this person? Why are they supposed to suffer? But he doesn't tell us then. I think in my mind it would help if God would stop for a moment and come down and say, this is why that happened, so I can compute it. And maybe it would help, maybe it would. Maybe, maybe I would be more angry at God in those moments if he said the reason why this happened to you or your family or to your son is because of this, and I thought that was a minor thing, and say, God, how can you do this to me? Maybe I'd be more upset about it. Or maybe if God said, well, Satan said your, your life was blessed, and so he gave you this extra push to test your faith, maybe I'd be more angry at God, and maybe Job would have been. But God doesn't give us answers. I wish he did. I've spent sleepless nights trying to ask God to give me something. Give me a reason. Tell me why. And Job sits asking God why do these things happen. You know, counseling individuals who've gone through things like divorce. But they've loved a spouse, and the spouse walked down on them. And they sit there, and they say, God, why? Or watching an associate minister's wife die of ALS and seeing the struggle of God asking why? Yeah, those are questions we wish we'd know, but God doesn't tell us. We have to sit with uncertainty. Amanda would probably amen this too loudly for the church here, but I'm a person who likes control of situations. You know, I like to be able to like, here's the plan, here's what we're going to do, here's how it's going to work out. Some things you can't control. And you're not told why you can't control them. And God says, we're not ready for the why. The only answer God really gives Job is, Job, you can't comprehend why I do things. And I see why. I think if God would have told Job, Job, the reason you have this is because I told Satan he could do it, I'm not sure that would have helped Job at all. Because you would have had a, a moment like Job's wife where Job's wife might be the most honest person in the entire story where she says, why don't you just say no to this God? If this is the God you serve that does stuff like this, then just say no to that God and be done with it. Now, now remember the world they're living in. This is not a world where like you have one God, so to speak. You've got numerous they could have chose from. And basically, she might be saying, let's say goodbye to this one and pick out a different one that might help us a little bit better. Don't think for a moment that doesn't happen in our world. You know, atheism picks up one God, a different one. Maybe it's a God of science or advancement or technology or reason. And they say, this is, this is going to be our new God because they're uncomfortable with the God that we have. Should we unanswer questions or difficulties? Or some people deny that God would say this or say that, and, and they make a new God in their new image because they're uncomfortable with this. We can't understand God's way, so we just pick a new God. And it appears like when she says, curse God and die, or bless God and die, or, or move on for God, or say goodbye, she's saying, Job, there's got to be a better option. Stepping back in faith, we believe that God created the world and Jesus has been resurrected, so there's no really other option in our mind. But if you had to, to step back for a moment, you, you, in, in the midst of life's suffering, in the, in the raw, rawness of, of those moments at late at night, the answer is sometimes you wonder if there wouldn't be a better choice. That's what Job's wife is pushing at. Job, are you sure this is the God you want to serve? Look what he's done to you. So 
I say Job is not one of those easy books that you read and you smile at the end. Hey, he got all of his family back. One of those books you read, you close up and you say, life is dirty and gritty and God's honest about it. But he doesn't answer their questions. Because he doesn't think you can handle it. I don't think it's, you know, one of those movie Hollywood things, you can't handle the truth sort of scenarios. God's created us, so I think He would know better than most if we can handle it. And God sees greater than we do. And to some degree, God's purposes might be different than ours or what we think is best for us. So God just tells Job, here's what I've done, Job. You can't handle those explanations. You can't handle why the righteous suffer. I've seen seminars before where people want to explain, like, I'll come to your church and spend five lessons, and I'll tell you why the righteous suffer. Or like, well, you, you can't do that, because God told Job he wasn't going to let him. And he's, you might be a great mind and preacher, but God's not going to give you that answer either. You've got to live with knowing God doesn't think you can handle it. So you have to live exhibiting your faith. Job's wife plays in here. Because Job, Job's wife becomes the prop of whether or not Job will continue to stay faithful. Why is Job suffering from our perspective in chapters 1 and 2? Because Satan has come to God and said, God, he only serves you because you've given him everything. Take it away and see what happens. The whole point of this trial for Job is to test his faith, to see if he'll stay faithful in the midst of suffering. What is his wife saying? Walk away, Job. No faith is worth this. Now, tie that as well with the idea there's not a real big understanding of afterlife at this moment. God hasn't revealed that to them. So this life is basically all they're seeing. And you see even more so where he's saying, this is how you want to live the life you've gotten? This God who, who obviously you believe you're righteous, have done nothing wrong, but he's punished you in this way? Why don't you just say bye to this guy? What's the worst he's going to do, kill you? Can it be any worse than what you're suffering right now? She's bringing up the question of Satan in a different way where, where Satan says he will not stay faithful, and the wife comes in and says, Job, why would you stay faithful? What's, what's the reason for this? God hasn't kept his end of the bargain, it doesn't appear, Job. Why stay faithful to him? Which I think is the point of the entire book of Job, where we get to see a man be put through the ringer and suffer, but in the end, it's not that he has a happy ending with ten more children, it's that he remained faithful through it all. He exhibited faith in the midst of all of that. I will tell you this, if I had a choice to having to exhibit faith in the midst of suffering or not suffering, I would choose not suffering 100% of the time. Job's not given that choice, and neither are we. We're not given the choice to walk into a doctor's office and say, God, I'm going to walk in. They're going to tell me cancer or not. And I'm going to choose not to suffer, and that way I don't have to show my faith. If you don't mind, just say yes to that. We don't get that, right? We get told you have cancer, you have this thing, you have that thing, you have this diagnosis, and then we're told walk through it. All the example of Job is, here's a man who kept his integrity in the midst of perverse suffering. Suffering I can't imagine. But it gave him a chance to exhibit genuine faith. I'd prefer God, and in fact, Mike, who's the associate minister and I, were talking probably three months ago and sitting around a table somewhere, and we both said, it's, we get it when people come up and say, your faith helps me. But if People didn't know anything about our situation and there was no suffering and his wife was here and Emma didn't have to do treatments. I could care less what you think about my faith. But Job had the chance to exhibit faith here. And his wife basically says why. So I think it's what every sufferer goes through. You go through the wife and Job in your head at some point. Well, on the one hand, you say, I, I believe in God. Because for me, I believe that no, no matter how much my world was rocked and is continued at times to be rocked and trying to deal with this stuff, I, I believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Which is one of those insurmountable beliefs that means I believe He is God. And so I just accept that. 
And I have to reorient everything else trying to figure out how that fits and trying to, to figure out how God fits into all this suffering and things that happen there. There comes a point where you say, is it better just not to have to fight that? Just move on from God, so to speak. And I have to have that uneasiness of, how can God do this and not do that? Job presents that, that fight. And within the couple of a married couple, Job and his wife, and Job holding on to his faith and integrity throughout, and the wife saying, Job, it's not worth it. And in our own lives, we have those moments where we say, God, why did you do this? And for some people, they come out there so strong in their faith, and for others, we're, we're going, maybe it's best just to step away. At least I wouldn't have the anguish of believing my Creator in some way has betrayed me. There's this fight here. Well, you have to decide if you're going to exhibit faith or not. You can't choose, and wish we could, if you're going to have suffering. You can choose if you exhibit faith throughout it. On a side note, I won't get into this. I've got to point to Cliff there, back. Can we go back a slide? I, who am I hitting here? He's, all right, I see a red dot there. Now I know where I'm pointing it at here. Cliff will deal with this when he deals with one of the friends, Eliphaz or Hodad or whoever's in there. But when it comes to suffering, Job also tells us this. You can lighten the load or you can increase it. I have cringed at what people have said to others in the midst of their suffering. I have cringed at what people have said to me. I had someone email Amanda and I uh, when Emmett was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis to say something to this effect. Sorry to hear that Emmett has cystic fibrosis. I hope everything you guys are doing well. Two spaces. I've got this product that I believe can help him during his particular time, and I think if you purchase it, it would help his clearance. To which, when I read it and Amanda read it, I told Amanda, I'll respond to this one, because I didn't want to see what she might write back to that person in that particular moment. You think, what are people thinking? The best thing you can do when someone is suffering is this. Tell them you love them. Tell them you're sorry. Pray for them. And then don't speak unless they do. Younger, I'm you know, still a younger preacher, but the gray in the side of my hair makes me feel like I'm getting older by the day. So when I have younger preachers who are in their early 20s ask me, I don't, I don't like going to hospitals. What do you say? I tell them, it's easy. You say nothing. You say hi, and you're there to pray for them, and you let them talk. And some people will talk your ear off, and some will kind of give you the hint of get out. What do you do when you have somebody who's been in a car crash? I was at Woodson, I guess just a few years we had one of the kids in our youth group die in a car accident, 15 or 16 years old. I go to the hospital. I'm told when I arrive, he's dead. I sat down, said nothing. Cried with the family. They'd share a story, I'd share a story, and I was silent. One of the dads whose daughter was dating this young man, who's not a guy who normally shares his feelings, wrote me and said, thank you for saying nothing last night. The best thing you could have done was just sitting there. Because we say some dumb things to people. Someone dies and we say, well, God wanted another angel. How do you, how do you know that? What does that even mean? Someone's sick and say, well, God wouldn't give you more than you can handle. That verse is not what it says anyways. You're, you're taking a verse out of context, but second, is that what they want to hear in that moment in time? If Job, if God in his wisdom does not give Job an explanation for his suffering, don't try to explain someone else's suffering away. Don't go there and tell them this is why God's doing this. You don't know. Just sit there and hurt with them. The command we're given is weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. Sit and cry and weep and just do that. The best thing Job's friends ever did was sit there and not say anything. When they tried to explain the situation to Job, they became, as Job said, terrible friends and witnesses. We conclude with Job's wife here. How does she fit? 
You know, when Cliff told me I had Job's wife, I first said thanks. I must have been the last person to sign up for a summer series if that's who you gave me. Until I realized Nick has Haggai, and it's not Haggai the prophet. It's some other Haggai I've never heard of in the Bible, and uh, Nick has him there. So, uh, yeah, Nick will have some work there at the end. But then the more I read Job, and on Sunday nights we're reading through books of the Bible at Woodson Chapel and discussing them. The more I read Job and the more I thought, how does Job's wife fit this story? I thought Job's wife is probably pretty honest with her feelings here. That we kind of give her a bad rap because how, how could anybody say, walk away from God? Read the Psalms. David says, how can you do this, God? Righteous men and women say, God, how dare you do stuff like this? They question if they should walk away from God or not. Because the truth is, people of faith who believe that God is good, that he's the creator, that he died for us, when they have bad things happen to them, it causes us this questioning. And those doubts aren't bad and they're not ungodly. They might not go away. At least some of mine haven't. But you've got to choose which path you'll take in life. Will you be Job and say, I'll keep my integrity and serve God no matter what? Because he gives and he takes away. Or do you think the path of a Job's wife that says, walk away from a God who will do something like that? That's what Job ends us with. But that choice. Yes, there's the happy ending, but it's not as happy as it appears. But it says, which one do you choose? Do you look at Job's wife and say, maybe she's not as far off as we think she is. Is it worth it? Or do you look at Job and say, I wish I had more answers. I wish I knew why. I wish God would have kept the hedge up. But God gave, and God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that's the fight in Job. So next time you read Job and you want to use his wife as a punchline, set for a moment with your own suffering or someone else and ask yourself have you ever had those moments where you thought God's been unfair with me maybe I should walk away that's what Job's wife is saying Job is a rather depressing book Life can be rather depressing. What I love about wisdom literature, which Job was a part of, is that it's honest. We sing blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven, but that's not life. Life is Job. Life is waking up one morning and God has taken something away. And you have to live with it. And during those times you pray that your faith can be like Job's. And you definitely pray you have better friends. He gives, he takes away. Job's wife says, because he takes away, walk away. And Job patiently suffers. And those are the choices you have in life. Walk away or patiently suffer and wait for something that God has in store in the future. Let's pray.